everyone. Um, thank you for the very uh, warm introduction. So for those of you who don't know me, and I'm assuming that's 90% of the room, um, other than Natalie, um, my name is Sam Hepburn, and I am a community uh, consultant focused on face-to-face -face events in the tech space. I spent the first half of my career in South Africa, so hence the accent. Uh, actually working in hospitality and banqueting before I moved to London, realised that I love technology, but more importantly realising that the technology space needed more people who weren't software developers doing cool things. And so I've been doing what I do now for about eight years. And so hopefully well versed and have enough knowledge to give you some information tonight. But you're not here to find out all about me, so feel free if you haven't to stalk me on LinkedIn or come chat to me afterwards, but we'll sort of move on. Um, but before I get started on actually sort of the core content, I want to know a little bit about you. Yes, I'm one of those people that make you do things. Um, so we'll do it like school where you have to put your hand up. Uh, but how many people in the room have, um, they organize events currently for their organization? Amazing. Now keep your hand up if events is in your job title. So you were hired to be an events manager or executive or, yeah. Not as many, um, thank you. Um, for those of you who put down your hand, what is, I'm assuming you're juggling more than one thing. I know we have um, Amy at the back who does a lot of marketing and things and events as part of it, but what are other people doing? Feel free to shout at me. Is anyone in HR maybe? Um, software development. Software development, yes. Marketing, yes. Shout some job titles at me, I'm not gonna list them off. Yeah, that is exactly what I was thinking next. <laughs> Any other types of roles? Startup, doing it all. Cool. And for those of you who aren't doing events, is that, is that something that you're potentially looking to do, can I assume, and maybe hiring through? How many people would like to hire through events? Okay, great. So. Um, hopefully by the end of today, you will, at least for the people who are running events, will um, add to what you're doing and sort of get you off the ground, and for the people who haven't started yet, will give you a good starting point. When I speak about hiring and attracting retaining talent, I'm not specifically speaking about events organizers, I'm speaking across your business. Um, I use a lot of tech references, but it can be applied everywhere. I also have a South African accent and speak very fast, so Please, my father shouted at me all the time, if I'm going too fast, tell me to stop, this event's for you. Um, I won't take offense to it, it's just the way I am, I kind of ramble on. Um, but yeah, let's get started. There's a lot of content to follow with um, a very short amount of time, so I'm gonna give you a high level overview. Um, and if anyone wants to go into more detail afterwards, come find me. Um, I'm also gonna break it up into the three sections, so we'll start off with hiring. Um, so when it comes to hiring, I'm sure most of us have tried the, I'm going to move this because it's in my way. Um, the traditional methods of putting CVs on a, well, job descriptions on a job board, um, using recruitment agents, whatever it may be to find work. Um, when it comes to the event space, I'll give you an idea of me personally. So I run between eight to 10 communities at any one time, doing a minimum of one to two events a week, which means on average, I run 80 events a year. And that's a, like a slow year for me. Um, so I do a lot of events. They range from anything from 20 people up to three and a half thousand people. Uh, and I can tell you one big secret. 70% of the companies I engage with or the people I work with are doing it to hire. They need to attract talent, especially, obviously I work a lot in the tech space and tech talent is really hard to get. Uh, but when it comes to good talent across any board, whether you're hiring for sales, marketing, events people, doctoral, something rather that was mentioned there. Good. Good talent is hard to find, and so people are trying to find alternative ways to hire um, and engage with talent, which means that you can sort of go far beyond the job spec of things. Another reason why people need to go out of the remit of just putting a job spec on a job board and hoping that someone will find you is because some people are just not looking, They're not actively looking for work. I'm going to do a little exercise now, and I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes. And please close your eyes, just in case someone's sitting next to their boss or anything like that. This is a safe space. I won't jump out and scare you, but close your eyes for a second. I now want you to put up your hand if you are actively looking for a new job. So you have put your CV out there and you've applied for a role. Cool. Now put your hands down. Now I want you to put up your hand if you would be open to having a discussion 
based on something specific. So maybe you love what you do, but you wouldn't mind working in a different industry. Maybe you love what you do, but you wouldn't mind potentially a more senior role, maybe a different project, maybe even more money. Keep your hand up. Cool, put your hands down, and now you can open your eyes. Now I'm not gonna tell you who put their hands up and why and how many things, but I can tell you now that a large majority of you did, and more people out of this room do it as well. <coughs> Because we actually generally do like what we do, but we are open to different opportunities. And that's the people that um, are sitting in that space are probably the best people you can hire. Because if someone is passively looking for a role, it means they own the conversation, which means that you can have, they're not just jumping ship, right? They're not just going, they're overselling their skills to you, so hopefully you'll hire them, or you sort of hire them and realize actually they hated their job so much they just accepted it. If you hire someone and they're passively looking, they actually actively want to work for you. They've chosen to leave a job they actually like because of something you've offered them. So passive people are the best people to hire. I'm now going to just quickly jump, I know it doesn't feel very smooth, but there's a reason in my madness, to talk about the other half of the talk, which is the upskilling and retaining talent. Because when I talk about the event side of things, we're going to talk about it together. So, upskilling and talent. I can tell you now that um, there's a lot of studies, and I found one picture I'll share with you, but almost, um, what is it, 45%, a large people leave their role based on the fact that they don't feel like they are growing within their role. And that goes down a lot to upskilling. And so I almost feel like if you're going to retain talent, you need to upskill your talent. Um, it is the best thing you can do. Now you're gonna tell me one of two things. You're either gonna say, but Sam, we have no budget. We're a startup with no money. We're spending it on something else. Training is expensive. It's so expensive, it's ridiculous. And so we don't have any money and that's where events come in really, really well and I'll get into that. Or I get this answer and I think it's terrible and they go, but what if they leave? What if I spend all this money on training and I send them to these training courses and they leave me? It's a lot of money you've invested in their knowledge and they've gone to put it at another company. Well, my argument to that is what if they stay? What if you don't train them and they stay in your organization? I would rather hire someone for two to three years that does some amazing work with me and then potentially moves on than hire someone for 10 to 12 years who is sitting and being dead weight. So if you're worried about investing in your team because they might leave you, more worry about what if you don't and they stay with you. The other nice thing about, and I'm sure you'll know this, but I'm going to reiterate it, is if you train your team, you can promote with, from within, which means that your senior management has been at your company for a longer time, they know your ethos, they know what you're doing, which means that they can hit the ground running. It also means that training and retention becomes easier because your upper level of ma management knows enough to train below them. Whereas if you're hiring in at a higher level and they don't really know your organization, you're trying to train more senior people, which costs way more money. So if you're using um, training as a technique to retain talent, you now have highly skilled people who don't only have cool skills, but they love what you do because they've been there. They feel supported. Also, most people, if you ask them about why they stay at the organization, even if they don't like it, they go, but I get so much training, I won't get it somewhere else, and so I don't want to leave. So even if they're unhappy, sometimes they'll stay. You don't want to keep unhappy people, but you know. So out of all that though, like how do we do it? So how do we do it if we don't have budget? How do we do it um, if we are, you know, sort of stretched for time and resources? How do we hire, how do we retain, and how do we attract? So in my personal opinion, there's loads of ways, but I'm gonna talk about three ways um, tonight because I'm gonna focus them on events. Um, and as I said, I'm gonna be a bit more sort of high level overview and I can go into any sort of details in the Q&A section. But the first thing is running your own events. So running your own events is a great way to attract um, talent because you bring people into your space, into what you're doing, um, and you get to them to connect with your brand. The only thing I would say with this is you need to be specific. Running a general event might get you some people in the room, but if you're looking to hire, it is a huge overhead um, to just run events for the sake of running events. Uh, we heard earlier about building a brand. It's a completely different thing. You can put out events and sort of blanket them to a large organization because you want the consumer to see what you're doing. With events on hiring, you want a lot of people to know what, you, what you're doing, but if the right people aren't in the room, not the people that you want to hire, it's kind of pointless. If you look at things like, say, you're looking to hire a marketing person, 
running a marketing event is great, but if you are aware of the marketing industry, there are so many different types of roles that running an event on, say, content marketing or brand strategy will allow you to then even fine tune who is in the room. Cool. Another thing to think about is timing is everything. So as Natalie said, I do a lot of stuff in the women in tech space. Um, and not only looking at, oh, I'm going to run a meetup like tonight and get people in the room is a good idea, but you need to understand who you're trying to hire. So if I'm trying to hire senior, say, woman uh, into a senior role and I do an evening event, chances are I may not attract them. Whereas, because you know, more seniors have more families, they need to get home, they need to do things. So maybe I do a breakfast event, which means that it allows the person, they've already done the school run, they're in a senior role, so they're more likely to be able to go into the office a half an hour, an hour later. So running an event at 9 a.m. where they can get back to the office by 11 is quite easy. People say they can't hire women in tech. They can. They're just approaching it the wrong way. So just think about who your target audience is and when are they available. If you're looking to hire events people, events people tend to work funny hours. So when are they more likely to be off to be able to come to your event? Might not be in the evening because they may be running events. It might not even be weekends because maybe they're doing festivals. So think about who you're hiring and when are they available to even come along. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. Next thing to think about is what draws a crowd. So what do you want to be known for? Or what are you known for? So bigger corporates um, has e have it a bit easier with this because people know them. So like you run an event at Google and chances are half the people come to Google just because they want to see the office. But what do you want to be known for when you become as big or as thing as Google and Facebook and all the rest of them? What do you want to be known for? And think about that when you're putting together your content. The other great thing about hosting your own events is that you've got an awesome, inspiring team to share their knowledge. They've done cool things. We heard from Amy earlier. She's taught you all this tonight. You don't need to Google it. So use your own team because nothing works better than hearing someone awesome speak at an event and then at the end of the event they go, you know what, we're actually hiring into our team. I sit and go, well, I want to work with that human every day. I might not be actively looking, but they seem cool. I want to have a chat with them. Or the project they spoke about seemed really interesting. Maybe for that project I would move. So your own employees become your brand advocates. When I say this to a lot of companies, I get a few things, but one of the things I get is, who me, speak at an event? Nah, none of my team would get up in front of an audience. They're not confident speakers. They're not like you, Sam. They won't get up there. Um, or what would we speak about? We, we're just not there yet. You know, when we get this product to be a bit better, then we'll go and speak about it. When we become experts in this area, then we'll go. Or I get things like, but what happens if I do a talk and my competitors in the room and they're going to steal all our ideas or our data? Please stop. <laughs> it is not as hard as you think. If you're looking to promote your team and get them to speak at events, an amazing way of doing it, and this is done a lot in the tech industry, but it's going across to most industries, is something called a brown bag session, which is a lunchtime session within your organization. So instead of me going and the first talk I ever do is in front of an audience of 50 people at a meetup, I go, okay, well, I'm just going to speak to my colleagues about something cool. It's a safe space where I can just learn to talk. Don't overthink it. That talk that you do internally doesn't need to be the next best thing that you do at a meetup or a conference or anything like that. It's just somewhere to get confident. The thing with that is you need to choose the language you use when you speak to your team. If you ask me today, hey, Sam, do you mind coming in and speaking to my company about something? Even me as an like, experienced speaker would be like, well, that just sounds like a lot of work. No. What is something? I need to know tangibly, like, what would you like me to speak on? So if you want your team or your, your um, managers, or maybe your marketing departments come to you and said, we need to do some events, we're not attracting marketing people or user experience people or events people, they need to actually identify within their team who's doing cool things and rather say to them, hey, you did that really cool project, do you mind presenting that to the team? Or you're doing a lot of work on our products at the moment. It would be really useful if our sales team knew more about how the product worked. Will you present to our sales team? Because then I go, okay, well, yeah, that makes logical sense. I'm not that comfortable, but I'll do it for that. So don't just ask, will you do a talk? Because everyone will say no. It seems like a lot of effort. But if you ask them for something tangible, they're more likely to say yes and build. The first time I got asked to do a talk, just moved to London, wasn't in the tech space at all. I started working for a recruitment company, and they said, would I talk at a tech event on how to inspire developers or something, because I was running this mentoring program. And I, they were like, but you're running the program, so can you just speak about the program? And I was like, well, that makes logical sense. Okay, fine, I'll do it. 
anyways, it went down okay and I learned a lot from it and some things I stumbled on and I had a lot of minions in my slides, so it was fine. Um, but once you've done the first one, it's like ripping off a band-aid, right? You get way more comfortable and realize, well, it's not the end of the world. People just want to learn. The other thing is, um, hopefully you've hired some cool people. So if you've got people on your team and you think none of them will be able to, not necessarily the speaking in front of an audience, because that is a skill you need to learn. But if you don't think anyone in your team is worth speaking in front of an audience, then maybe you've hired the wrong team altogether. Because you should be hiring cool people, right? People that inspire you, that are learning, that are doing different things. So if there's absolutely no one on your team, then I think you need to go back to the drawing board before you even go to an event. The thing that we talk about in terms of like, oh, when my product gets better, right? When I'm at the top of that mountain, I'll go and speak. Fine, by all means, we always want to put our best foot forward. But the one thing I want you to remember is there's always someone in front of you and someone behind you. So I'll give you an example of Uber. Uber's really cool, right? So if I am an individual and I'm about to start a startup and I think to myself, well, I really want to learn about what it's like to start an organization. I could go to an event where the founder of Uber speaks about his journey and that would be really cool and inspiring but they were valued at 120 billion this week that is un like ungraspable for me that is cool and exciting but i as someone who hasn't started that business yet that's like unreachable for me whereas if abc company i've never heard of just spoke about how they survived their first year and they were profitable that for me is tangible that i want to learn from so never think that you need to be at the top of the mountain in order to share knowledge. You just need to share what you know. Because there will always be someone behind you or a company behind you or an organization or a team member or someone that wants to come work for you that wants to learn that little bit you know that I don't know. So don't think you need to go up to the top of the mountain. On data and secrets, I'm not going to touch this too much, but anonymize it. It's not hard. If you don't want to tell anyone about your clients, don't tell them the client name. Strip the data away from it. Talk vaguely about that, but you can still share knowledge. Is anyone here in the finance industry? Cool. So this is a big problem in the finance industry. Whether you're running an event, speaking at events, your team members are going to an event, especially in the finance, and I'm sure it's in other places, you have this thing where you're not allowed to talk about the work you're doing. And so, never mind getting up on a stage and speaking about it, but even chatting, we've had a few networking things tonight, even chatting about the work you're doing, you're like, well, I actually don't know what I'm allowed to talk on, so we don't talk about anything. The problem is, is that individuals, we're human, right? And we like to hear, we like positive reinforcement from people, whether we know them or not. So when I talk to someone randomly at a networking event, and they say, what do you do? And I explain it, and I go, that's really cool. I sort of think back and I go, oh, yeah, this is kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing cool things. If I can't speak about what I'm doing, I don't get that satisfaction of someone telling me that's kind of cool. And so my retention goes out the window because it's easier to see that grass is greener on the other side. So if you are in a space where your team isn't potentially allowed to talk about what they're doing, whether it's finance, whether you're a brand new startup and you're protecting what you're doing, rather than tell your team what they can't say, educate them on what they can because then they have the tools to go, okay, cool. Well, I might not be able to talk about all of this, but these are the tools I can say so that when I am at an event, whether it's speaking or networking, I can talk about the cool shit I'm doing because then I will stay, then I will attract because someone else will go, well, that's kind of cool. I want to work on that. And so you have this just positive way of sort of word of mouth marketing for cool things you're doing in your organization. The last thing though, in terms of face-to-face -face events, it's hard. Running face-to-face -face events is a lot of time, money, and resources. And depending on what you're doing, it may not actually be worth it. If you're looking to hire one marketing person once a year, doing, so with the events, you need to be consistent, right? And you need to be specific. So if I want to attract um, events organizers, I can't run one events, uh, uh, the, if, sorry, one events event, there was too many events in that word, one events event and expect that like 50 people are going to come, 20 of them I'm going to want to interview and five of them I'm going to hire because it's not going to happen. Your first event, you might get the wrong people through the door, you might get the wrong amount of people and so you need to be consistent. And so if you're not looking to hire a lot of those people or you've got so many different types of roles, running events on marketing and software development and events consistently to drive like traffic up, it's just going to be too much effort. So I say, when you're looking at, at your own events, think about what you want to be a thought leader in. Because if you want to be a thought leader in, chances are you're looking to hire. 
So I can't pronounce that chip company's name because I'm not from here. But if they might look and go, you know what, we're going to do a lot of events on the food and beverage industry because generally speaking, we're hiring in that space a lot. We want to be thought leaders when it comes to um, potatoes. I don't know. Um, and so we'll do that as our sole sort of core event for us. But for everything else, we're going to look at partners. And partner events are a great way to get your name out and attract talent. There are so many communities, as I said, I run between eight to 10 communities at any one go, that there's so many communities out there. Why not tap into their markets? They've attracted, they've got the audience, they've got the right people in the room. Why not go and partner with them? So if you're looking to hire, I'm gonna use tech because that's where I work. But if you're looking to hire a Java developer, instead of running Java events every week, there's a Dublin Java user group. Why not reach out to them and see how you can partner? Because then I have access to a whole bunch of Java developers. I don't have to keep on running events just to attract the right person. I did a search on, does everyone know what meetup.com is? Community event, if you don't, it's a great place. I mean, I'm on there to find like board game meetups because I like playing board games and my friends don't. <laughs> but <laughs> they don't mind it, but not as much as I do. Um, next week alone, so Monday to Friday, there are 24 tech focused events in Dublin. So why would I run my own events when I can tap into 24 next week alone? So I'm sure there's more than that, but that was a very high thing of just look. I just literally wrote in technology, so I'm sure if I was more specific. The other great thing about it is it's free training, right? Communities are trying to find experts in their field to talk about what they're doing. You tonight have got a free tour of an awesome museum, by the way. I don't usually like museums. This museum is great. Some great food. Um, Amy's talk was absolutely brilliant. Mine, we'll see how it goes. But all for free, right? Other than giving up your time. And so your team can get trained by engaging with communities without you having to spend a cent. Maybe you let them come in later the next morning because it's coming out of their sort of time. They're way more productive. They're way more inspired. They want to do different things. So utilize the power of events that are already happening. So the next thing you say is, but why would they want to partner with me, Sam? There's some great events, but I've got to now get my organization in there, but why? So there are three different reasons um, why I appreciate a company engaging with me. The one thing is I'm always looking for sponsorship. So company, uh, events cost money to run. I need money for food, I need money for drinks. Um, if I can't get a venue to give me a free venue, I need money for venue and a whole bunch of different things. I need hosts. So some uh, of your, the companies you work, work in might have cool event spaces that sometimes just sit there dormantly, so I need a host. And the other thing is I need cool speakers. So if you can give one of those three things, I'll probably engage with you. But also remember at who you're partnering with. Because there can't be, the person organizing the event, you don't really want to clash, right? So some meetup communities are run by recruitment agents. You need to have a, have a chat with them on how they engage with companies at their events because some of them might not let you recruit out of it because that's what they do for a living. If they're a, say, technology event that is run by a tech company, they're there to reach out so developers will use their product. So they may be open for you to sponsor because your core business doesn't clash. So think about how you're going to proposition yourself when you speak to these people. But a lot of communities are just run by individuals who have a weird passion for doing things after hours. Don't ask me why. I do a whole bunch of them and I don't understand. The other thing that's really cool about partnering events is you get to meet some really cool people. So whether it be the speaker speaking at the event, whether it be the audience, events are, attract people who don't really do a nine to five. They have a passion for what they do. So when they finish work, they want to go to the Epic Museum until almost nine o'clock to hear about stuff because they're passionate about it, right? And so there's some really cool people in the room that you can utilize and not even leverage to hire, but leverage to actually train your team. So I was chatting to uh, the CTO of a company called Nestporter. I'm sure at least half of you know who they are. And they had a bit of a problem because they decided to introduce a new technology into their tech stack that not a lot of their developers knew how to code in. I don't know if you know how much you know, training courses cost, but especially in the tech space, you're looking at a minimum of like a thousand pounds a head to do like maybe a one, two day training course. It's really expensive. So you're looking to upskill your entire team. No one has that budget. It doesn't matter how big or small you are. 
So what they did that was really different, that they met a really cool guy who was coding in that technology, who was a freelancer at an event. He had actually done a talk, so they saw that he was engaging, engaging. And they hired him once a week to come in and either do a bit of a training with the team or pair program with them, because we all learn. Like how many people in this room are doing exactly what they studied today? Kind of, yeah. I never went to uni, so I just learned as I went along. So we're a human, we adapt. If our company won't train us and we're that interested, we'll learn, right? But how cool would it be if we were learning on our own and every now and then we could turn to an expert and go, I'm kind of stuck with this, do you mind showing me? That guy's day rate, even a highly skilled developer, you're looking at, say, what, a thousand pound day rate? But a thousand pounds once a week is enough money to maybe send one person on a training, a two-day training course. Whereas now he's engaging with an entire team. So think about other ways you can utilize to train your team. It doesn't need to be that you send them off. Because a piece of paper doesn't really mean that much. Unless you're becoming a doctor, like you want the skills, right? The final way um, I like to engage is conferencing. So I'm not going to touch on this too much, but conferences and events are a really great way to engage with talent on hiring and retaining. On the hiring front, it goes back to what I said about the, oh, that person's kind of cool. I wouldn't mind working with them, to their project's kind of cool. Um, if anyone here is looking at sponsoring a conference, I run two conferences myself, and I often get, and we work with our uh, customers to figure out what works best, but I get asked, hey Sam, with our sponsorship package, can we get a speaking slot? And yes, we'll guide them to what we will allow them to speak about and what we won't, but you can get a speaking slot with your package. So don't just pay for a spot at a conference, stand in a booth and just hope the world will come to you. Talk to the conference organizers and see how you can best utilize that sponsorship. So yeah, as I said, speaking at an event is an awesome way. And now you've got a build up approach, right? So first the guy does, or the girl, does a brown bag session within your organization. They get a bit confident. They maybe come to a meetup like this and they share their knowledge. And then next month, they're speaking at a conference and they're talking about the cool things. Because people want to work with cool people. So the more you can showcase the cool stuff you're doing, and as I said, you don't have to be at the top of the mountain, but the more you can showcase that, the better. The other little tidbits is, obviously, as in terms of retention, if I am that person that you've helped guide me to become better at speaking, I see myself as a thought leader. And I see that you help me get that way. So weirdly, subconsciously, I feel like I'm indebted to you. And so I'm more likely to stay and keep my knowledge. The other thing is conferences are a great way for training. There are a lot of thought leaders. Conferences um, invite really cool speakers to speak because they want to attract a crowd, which means that if your team is going to that event, they're getting to see really cool content. Um, and yeah, they can just get to learn from the best in the business. And again, if you're looking to sponsor a conference, ask how many tickets do I get with my package? Because chances are, They'll give you a whole bunch of free tickets to send your team. So ask that. Like, you should be, if you're doing conferencing to hire, you should be going to conferences that your team want to go to as well. Because then you've got the booth where you're talking about hiring, but your team members are in, in like sessions, they're at like the party in the evening, and they're talking about your brand. Hey, what do you do? Oh, I work at this company, this is the cool things. Oh, actually, we've got a booth, did you see it? Yeah, I'm actually one of the software developers there, or the marketing people there. I work there. I think it's really cool. We're actually hiring for marketing. There's your sales and everything straight away. But all of this, all of that, usually the screen's behind me and I get to do this, but now I can't. All of that is actually really, really useless if you don't have a process. So events for anything, if marketing, whatever it may be, they're not your colouring in department. They're not, oh, hey... We're struggling with sales, send the marketing people to sprinkle some fairy dust. Oh, hey, we're struggling to attract talent, send the HR people to sprinkle some fairy dust. There has to be a process. It's a data-driven space. So you need to think about your pre, your during, and your post-event. Like, what is, what is the journey I'm going to take a candidate through? It's one thing to not have a journey when you're doing traditional um, recruitment, like putting um, job specs on a job board because at the end of the day, you're just like a job spec on a computer. But if someone is interacting with you from an events point of view, you've become a human. And so I hold you to more. And so you need a process. It is a, also, if you're looking to hire with events, your first event, 
you'll be really lucky if you hire someone, whether you're partnering, conferencing, running your own events. So I need you to treat it as a branding piece. It is a reap so much reward once it's got consistency, but if you're measuring it based on per event, then don't do it. So pre-event, we've covered a lot of this, but one thing I wanna just mention on the content side of things is know your audience. So if I wanna hire, say, a senior web developer, Doing a, uh, an event on the introduction to JavaScript, for anyone who's not technical, like introduction to anything is very low, um, is not going to attract the right crowd. So think about, like, if I want people in the room, what content would attract them there? And if you don't know, one good thing if you've already got someone in that position, so say you're looking to grow your sales team, right? Go to your sales team and go, with this content, would you go to this event? Because you're trying to hire more people that do the same role. And if they say no, go right, what event would you go to? Because we want to put content on that to attract more people like you. If you don't have that person in your organization, you've got a friend, you've got someone else, you have someone you can reach out to and talk to. People don't mind being asked questions. Go ask them. The second thing is during the event, and this I see where companies fall flat on their face a lot of the time, is they do all this effort. They do marketing, they do everything, they run this great event, they all get out there, and then their core team is standing in the corner there in the bar talking to themselves. If you're doing an event to attract talent, it is not a team building event. Do team building another time. These people are working, so they need to feel like it's work, right? You need to equip them. You need to, if you're just going to an event to collect data on the sign up sheet and then spam email them afterwards going, hey, if you're looking for a job, come work with us, you're not going beyond the job spec. You might as well just put your job on a job board and hope for the best. So people want human interaction. So go speak to people. Find out what they're doing. In my opinion, write down notes because nothing goes better than someone who emails me afterwards and goes, hey, Sam, it was great speaking to you. I really enjoyed talking about Africa or whatever we spoke about. I know you said you weren't actively looking for another events role, but we're kind of hiring at the moment. Could I maybe entice you? They're no longer just an email. They're a human to me. So at least I will respond. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how you can dive more into that. But yeah, you need to interact with the humans. And post-event, and probably the most important part of it, is follow-up. You need to follow up with the people that you interact with. I, I do a lot of um, speaking on how to like, find work and how to do all that side of things. And I call it, don't, is this recorded? It is recorded, sorry. Uh, don't throw shit at a wall and hope it sticks. Like you can't just blanket do this thing and do these events and do all of this and hope that the world will come to you. You need to follow up. Even if someone at the event said, oh, it's really cool, I'd love to work with you, you still, it's still a nervous thing, right? Did, did the person I interact with actually really want to hire me? So I want to hear from the company that I was cool. So reach out to the people. If you've got business cards on you, that's great, but get your team to take their details because you need to put the power back into your hands. I see it all the time. I run an event in London called Find a Tech Job which allows employers and companies to chat to each other. And a lot of the employers go, but we gave them our business cards and no one emailed us. Yeah, because we're humans, we get nervous, we get scared, we kind of like our jobs, oh, maybe we won't look. So you need to own it. I'll give you an example of sort of wanting to not leave and leave a company. So I used to work at a company called General Assembly, it's an education technology startup, and I loved it. It was probably one of the best places I ever worked. I was underpaid, overworked, half the time I didn't actually really like what I was doing, but for some reason, my team, the things I was working on, the fact that my boss listened to me, I loved what I did. And at an event, I met a woman who worked at this company. And after the event, she emailed me and she said, hey Sam, we're looking for a community manager, will you come in? And I said, you know what, thanks so much, it was lovely meeting you, but no thank you. And that's where a lot of you will stop. You'll go, cool, I tried, I followed up. What she said to me was, okay, well, fine. If you don't want to come work for us, maybe I can take you for a lunch because I value your opinion. You seem to be a type of person I'd like to maybe hire. Could I take you for a lunch and pick your brain? And me and my own self-ego, I was like, yeah, I'll tell you what to hire. And I'll go for a free lunch. Yes, please. So I went for lunch with her. She told me all about the role because she was telling me about the role because, you know, I was going to help her hire someone else. And the more she told me about the role, the more I was like, that's kind of cool. Like, I want to do that. But I really like my company. So no, 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 no. Like, and she sort of said to me, like, well, what would make you leave? Like, I know it's not about something specific, but what, what is it that... And the more we spoke about it, the more I was almost like, as much as I like my role, it's an opportunity I almost can't give up. And because I was in that position of owning it myself, we could have an honest conversation. Because it was an honest conversation, I actually went to the managing director, General Semi, and I had an honest conversation with him. 
It wasn't all of a sudden he got a resignation letter on his desk and he was just as surprised. We discussed it. I said, I don't want to leave you, but they've offered me this. What do you think? It's more in line with the more the community stuff I wanted to do. And so we decided together, who does that with their boss, that I would leave him. <laughs> Weird. Uh, but since then, now I go back and I freelance and because I've since left Juno Juno and now I go back and I freelance and, you know, like, don't burn bridges. Like, it is okay to interact and speak to people. And, and if they don't, if they don't get to the end of the road like I did and actually join the team, People who do the same thing kind of sometimes hang out together. So I may have recommended someone else for the role. And recommendations go so far. I realize that we're running out of time, so I'm going to go through this a bit longer. So the last thing I want to say is during the process, I just want you to think that these people are human. And so if you interact with someone at an event and they're really well spoken, their guard's down, right? You're just at an event, you're having a drink, you're talking about cool things, I'm going to be candid. And then you bring me in for an interview and maybe I'm not as well spoken as I was or because I'm nervous. So have some empathy towards the people you're interviewing. Also remember that there'll be a lot of people in the room that you don't want to hire. They've taken the time to interact with you. If I stood here now and I was working for an organization, I said, oh, by the way, we're, we're hiring. And someone in the room didn't have the right skill set and they applied. They're no longer just applying to a job board. They're interacting with my brand because I've asked them to. And so it is common courtesy for me to go back to them. And even, even if it's no, I need to say no. So your process on follow-up has to be high. Kind of that point was with the slide, to be nice to people, even if they're the wrong people. Also, the reason why they're the wrong people might be because they don't have the right skill set right now. They might go on to do amazing things and you want to hire them later. Also, the industry is really, really small. So I used to run events um, for this one company and um, they approached me a lot of the time looking, oh, we're looking to hire. And because of the nature of what I do, I speak to a lot of candidates. So they would say, oh, I'm looking for a job. I'm not a recruiter, but it's just what I do. People ask me. And so I turned to Ken and I said, oh, actually, this company is looking to hire. Do you want to speak to them? And they were really highly skilled. Like, this company would have died to hire them. And they were like, no, you know what? A, friend, a few of my friends have actually applied there, and they've had such a bad um, thing with the process. They didn't get feedback. I don't even want to waste my time. I actually got with that company more than once a candidate turned down. And they were a cool company. Turned down, even being put forward for the role because of the experience a friend had. They had to redo their whole branding to fix it. And this is not a lie, like it actually happened and they were really cool. So just think about the brand you're putting forward if you're not. Even if it is a generic email that feels personal. You can write generic emails that are auto-response that feel personal. You don't have to do it yourself, but just do that. And the final thing I want to say is just remember that people are humans. The same way, is anyone here sitting in HR? Great. Is anyone here hiring into their current team? Okay, so you're hiring into your current team. So you're really good at what you do, right? You're hiring in, I am a community manager. I want to hire another community person. I know what I need from the community person. It doesn't mean that I'm personally really good at interviewing. Interviewing is a skill. Some people are really uncomfortable with it. And it's the other way around as well. As a candidate, I could be brilliant at what I do. It might just mean that I'm a bit awkward when it comes to interviews. I personally am highly dyslexic. And so if someone judged me, obviously I've got friends to spell check that my CV doesn't have a spelling mistake in it because I use my resources. But if someone judged me on the fact that they might see a spelling mistake somewhere, I would never get a job. And if they do judge me, fine. I never want to work for them anyway. But just understand that people have different strengths and weaknesses, so judge them on what you need them to do for the role. If someone's hiring me to be a public speaker and they judge me because I can't spell, what is the point? But if someone's hiring me to be a copy and content person and I can't spell, okay, now, you know, we have problems. So just think about what you're looking to hire. They are just human beings at the end of the day. The same way you want empathy towards you, they want empathy towards them. Anyways, that's enough about all of that. Hopefully I haven't word vomited you too much. But just in summary, if you're going to do events, be specific about what you want. Look at partners. They're a great way to sort of amplify your brand. Have a process, and that's probably do it before you do anything else. Half the companies I work for before we even do anything, we have to fix a process. Follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, and empower your team, whether it be to speak, to engage, to go to events, to do different things. The more they feel empowered, the more they will fight for your brand. Thank you.